This is a demo driven lesson. Throughout the years, I've compiled different tips, tricks, techniques, strategies, and approaches on how to recover your databases. And I've been testing these as early as SQL Server 2005. Yes, you heard that right. So if you still have versions of SQL Server as early as SQL Server 2005 lying around your environment, these techniques will work. These compilations of demos span multiple scenarios from as simple as recovering a database to performing online piecemeal restore to doing page level restores. Just like a firefighter going through the drills and running through the exercises, improving their skills so that when the real disaster strikes, they're ready. A great DBA does exactly that. You take care of the skills that you need to learn, the scripts that you need to use, different scenarios in practice, so that when real disaster strikes, you're in the right frame of mind to resolve that issue, recover your database, and provide higher availability. Again, going back to our main objective, recovery objectives and service level agreements. The first demo that I'm gonna be doing is taking tail of the log backups. You've probably seen me do this in some of the previous demos in previous lessons where I talk about taking the tail of the log backups. It's a simple demo highlighting a very important concept that if and whenever possible, you take the tail of the log backup. Switching gears here to my demo environment, I'm gonna walk you through a demo that uses the tail of the log backups that you've taken. Very important concept, as I've already mentioned. If and whenever possible, the first thing that you do in case of a disaster is take the tail of the log backups. So to start with, I'm going to create a database, very simple database, nothing fancy here. I'll name my database TestDB, and I'll switch it to full recovery model. Why am I doing this? Well, I would assume that somebody may or may not have changed the model database and the recovery model is totally different. So in order for me to take the tail of the log backup, I need to be in the full recovery model. Next, I'll create a very simple table a table with two columns and a clustered index on the identity column. And then I'll start performing transactions on that particular table. Let's take a full database backup. So now I know that my full database backup contains that first row that I've inserted. Once my backup is done, I'll start adding more rows potentially 1,000 rows. And once that uh, transaction is done, I can take a look at my database, that particular table to verify that I have indeed 1,000 in one rows. That's the first row, which is uh, the one that is in our full database backup. And 1,000 rows after performing that insert command. Now, since we are in the full recovery model, we can perform tail of the log backup. So let's simulate a system crash by running shutdown with no wait. Again, not something that you would do in production. And let's imagine, let's imagine that the database file or the data file got corrupted. So I would, in this case, delete my data file. Well, I can do this because the SQL Server database is uh, rather the service is unavailable. So the database file has been deleted. The log file is still kept intact. This is one of the things that we talked about in previous lessons where you have to provision a highly available redundant disk subsystem and separate your database files from your log files. This is one of those reasons why you have to do that. So let me start the SQL Server service using the command line. SQL Server service has been started. And let's see if we can access the database. I know that I would get a disconnection error and I get an error message. Well, we know exactly what this is because we've introduced a corruption. 
database cannot be opened due to inaccessible files. You can argue about the fact that it may be a memory or disk space problem based on the error message, but we know that the database is inaccessible because we deleted the data file. Let's take a look at the error log for what the real reason is behind the error. SQL Server error log will tell you exact, the exact same thing. Database file is inaccessible. It's failed to open the explicitly defined or specified database, and we know exactly what the problem is. So what do we do? As I mentioned, the very first thing that you need to do if and whenever possible is to take the tail of the log backup. And the tail of the log backup is really no special command except that now you are specifying the no truncate option when you're performing the tail of the log backup. So let's run a tail of the log backup. This tells me that the transactions that have occurred before the database got corrupted is still in my transaction log. Therefore, I can grab those transactions and restore them before this incident happened. So what I'll try to do, since I have full backups, I know that I can restore from my full backup. The assumption, of course, is you have, number one, a database backup, and that you know that your database backups work fine. Well, there's really no sense in trying to restore a database from backup if the backup is not working well. So in this case, I know that my backups are working well. I'll restore from backup. Note the no recovery option in this particular example. Every time you're doing a restore of your database, and again, you've probably seen me do this in some of the previous demos that I've done, use the no recovery option so that you can, whenever necessary, restore additional backups, whether they're differential or log backups. I try to do this as a practice, even if it's the last backup that I'm restoring, and just run restore database with recovery as the last step. In this case, since we still have the tail of the log backup to restore, I can specify the no recovery option and recover using the tail of the log backup that I took before I started restoring the database. Recovering from the tail of the log backup is done. And let's see if we have all of those records prior to my database going haywire. Looking at the records, yes, indeed, I do have 1,001 rows, number of rows that were in the database prior to an unexpected crash. This highlights the importance of always taking tail of the log backups if and when necessary prior to doing a restore. In the second demo, I'll walk you through recovering a database to a specific point in time. Part of your uh, job as a database administrator is to do some investigations and to find out when a specific incident happened so that you can restore your database to that specific point in time. I'll be highlighting the use of the stop app clause and the restore database or the restore log command while you're restoring from backups. I'm switching back to my demo environment here. I'm gonna walk you through the process of restoring or recovering a database to a specific point in time. I'll be using a sample database called Demo Sales DB for this particular demo, but if you want to follow along and try this demo yourself, I strongly recommend that you visit the msequeltips.com website. Back in 2008, I wrote an article called Disaster Recovery Procedures in SQL Server 2005. Yes, I know it does say SQL Server 2005, but as I mentioned, these tips and tricks and techniques will work up to SQL Server 2012. So in this article, I've provided you with the steps and the procedures on how to perform this task mm -hmm. using the Northwind database from Microsoft. So you can download the Northwind database for your reference, or you can even use your own. I've provided the different scripts, procedures, and explained how I went about 
the process. So I strongly recommend that you go ahead and go through this article, look at the scripts, copy the scripts, use the Northwind database and follow along. So the first thing that I need to do is take a full database backup. I'm going to resize this a bit because I will use my uh, application to simulate some transactions. First thing that I need to do is take a full database backup. Working full database backup should be the starting point for your recovery or your restore sequence. Next thing that I need to do is look at the number of records in the in the sales table. The sales table will be the point of reference for this exercise. So I'm going to copy the number of records in the sales table. 724, 7.24 million records. And I'll uh, simulate some transactions. The transactions will read off of some of the tables inside the demo sales DB database and insert records in the sales table. Now let's simulate a disaster. Not something easy to, uh, to recreate, but in this case it's a very simple disaster to recreate. Imagine somebody accidentally dropping the sales table. Now you might be thinking, well it's not that easy, especially if you got foreign key constraints and business logic wrapped into the object. Well you're right, but in some cases where if this is a third party application and it wasn't designed well, and you don't have all those constraints and restrictions to prevent anybody from dropping objects while well, you're out of luck. What I'm doing here is I'm recording the time, date and time when this incident happened. In real life, you won't have this. But again, I just, I just don't wanna go through and waste my time in trying to do this. Let's assume part of my job as a DBA is to do the investigation and find out when this particular incident happened. So I'm going to drop the table again, not intentionally, maybe accidentally. Um, an application which was misconfigured so that instead of pointing to development, it was redirected to production. Maybe again, an end user accidentally dropping a table. So let's say that the incident already happened and I've got the point in time when this particular incident happened. Again, in real life, you won't have this. You would have to do some investigation to find out if and when this thing happened. So I've already got that timestamp. Notice my applications are starting to fail or have started to fail. Uh, one of my applications is now reporting an error where the sales table is no longer available. Now, this is a very good opportunity to take a look at your monitoring. Aside from monitoring for performance, you might want to monitor for dropped objects, some of these error messages that are getting thrown out. If you have that and you're getting alerted, you know exactly when this thing happened because when the error message popped up, you can get alerted and you can get a text message, a phone call, and you can correlate the time between the alert coming in and when this particular event happened. So it's, it's, it's that easy if you have monitoring in place. So let's take a look at the different options that we have. This particular database only has a single data file, a single log file, and a single file group not much options that we have as far as availability is concerned. This is typical of a lot of databases out there where you have, again, a single data file, a single file group. So the only option we have right now is to restore from backups. So let's contain the disaster by restricting access to the database. The reason being is I don't want anybody to be doing anything else in this database while I'm trying to recover or restore the database to its working, good working state. And notice that my transactions or my applications got disconnected. At this point, the database is technically offline. So the goal is to minimize what you need to do between here and taking the database online and making sure that you meet your recovery objectives, your recovery time objective and your service level agreement. 
So what do we need to do next? Well, I'm guessing you already know. Well, that's right. It's taking the tail of the log back up. So I'll take the tail of the log back up and this will form a part of my restore sequence. If you have several log backups that have occurred since the latest full backup, you would have to include those as well. And the last backup that you will restore is the tail of the log backup. Let's take a look at the different backups that we have. We know we have a full backup and we have a log backup and nothing else in between. So we can go ahead and do that. The first thing is to restore database backup from the full backup using restricted user and no recovery. Note that I have no recovery because I still have the tail of the log backup to restore. So I'm going to restore that. And if you notice, it's taking quite a while to restore my database. Going back to uh, the lesson on instant file initialization and that, how that affects your recovery. I've configured my SQL Server service and grant that to perform volume maintenance tasks permission so that instant file initialization is enabled so that it only takes me a couple of seconds to restore this database. And this is not a, simple, a small database. It's roughly about 500 gig, uh, megabyte database. So I restored my database, my full database backup, and I will restore my tail of the log backup to that specific point in time. This is the part where I use the stop at clause with my restore command. And notice that I'm using 2007, my timestamp. I did mention that I've been using this as part of my disaster recovery exercise since 2007. So let me just use that timestamp. Again, not as easy as you think it is, especially if you don't know what this timestamp is. So I'm gonna recover that and let's assume that this was 1557, one second before and this was the point where I know the database was in good working condition. So I'm going to restore the log, my tail of the log backup, and investigate whether or not it's enough to restore the tail of the log backup at this point. Let's take a look at the drop table and see if it, it existed at that point. Yes, my uh, tail of the log backup did manage to restore the table up to that point. The problem is if you don't get anything in here, you would have to go back and restore the full backup, restore the tail of the log backup, and go back to an earlier point in time with the stop at command. And again, this is gonna be part of your, your investigation, but my recommendation would be just get the database online and do the investigation after the fact because you want to target your service level agreement and recovery objectives to minimize your downtime. So we know that the sales table is back online. We can create a snapshot of my, uh, my uh, good working database at that point in time. Just wanna make sure that I have this particular folder in there. So I've created a database snapshot of that database that I've restored where the sales table is already available. So if I look at my uh, structure here, my database is still in restricted user mode and I've got a snapshot to that point in time when this database was restored and the sales table is available. Now we will be using the snapshot later on as part of our investigation. But at this point, the goal is to bring the database online as fast as we can. So let's take a look at the, uh, the identity column for my sales table. This is, be, this is going to be a bit more complicated depending on the structure of your database, especially if your, the column that you use for primary key is really not as straightforward as an identity column. In this case, the sales table has my primary key defined as an identity column. So I'm gonna use these values, 7.27, 7.27. I would create a gap between those values. So maybe I could use not six, but maybe seven. I'll create this gap in my sales table so that while I switch the database to 
multi-user mode and allow users to start uh, inserting records back to the sales table. I have that gap so that I can restore the records or reinsert the records back and fill that gap. Like I said, I'm not really concerned how much gap I create at this point. I know I also need to reconsider that as part of my recovery strategy. But at this point, the goal is to bring the database online as quickly as I possibly can. Once I'm done, I can switch the database to multi-user, back to multi-user, and I can allow my users to connect back in. Everyone's happy. My boss is probably happy, but my job is not done yet. Remember, what I've simply done is restore the database to a point in time where my database is in a known good working condition, which means the sales table is back online. My users can connect back. My applications can connect back. I've met my recovery objectives in my service level agreement and everyone's happy, but my job's not done yet. This is the part where everybody else is happy and doing their job, this is the part where I start doing my investigation. So what do I do? The first thing that I need to do is I'll create a copy of the database. I'll create a copy of the database and I'll make sure that I have the correct folder. I'll create a copy of the database that I'll use as part of my investigation. So I'll restore the database and use whatever value that I used earlier to restore another copy of that database. I know this is a good working copy and of course we use 57 in the earlier restore. I'm going to use another copy of the database as part of my investigation. I certainly wouldn't want to touch my already online, already live production database for investigation. And so that's the reason why I'm creating an extra copy of that database. I'll use the exact same timestamp here. For my log. And I'll also use a standby. Now this is what you'll see when you configure log shipping with a read-only option. In this case, what we're trying to do is we're trying to restore the transaction log using the wood standby option. The reason being is we don't want the database to go in recovery because we're still going to go through and restore several log backups as we move along. Now, we may have log backups, we may not have log backups, but the, the idea behind doing this is while I'm doing my investigation, especially in a very large database, is I want to stop when I did my restore so that I can take a look at the database. It's in read-only mode using the standby option. And I can check whether that's the point where I stop or I need to move on. So I'm going to restore my database using those options. Again, using the stop at command, in this case, the with standby option so that I can take a look at the database while not fully recovering the database that I'll know whether or not I'll continue or, I, or I'll stop at this point. So the database is still being restored and that's done. This is the part where if you don't really know, if you didn't really know what happened, you'll have to go through and inch through the process. Restore, stop at, check. If it isn't, restore, stop at, check. Until you find a point in time where you know this was the exact point in time before this particular incident happened. Microsecond, millisecond, that means a lot in highly transactional databases. In this case, we we know because it's really not a real life example. We just know that we captured that timestamp, right? So let's compare the snapshot with the restored database. This was the restored database. This is the snapshot. 
that we used. Or better yet, the snapshot. Let me copy that. Refresh and copy, restore snapshot. Copy that over here. We'll compare this, not the production, but the snapshot. And do comparison between the two. And lo and behold, we're lucky enough we got the exact same number of records. If not, again, you would have to institute the process, restore the full backup, restore the log backup using the stop at command, read the contents. If it was the right uh, point in time, then you're done. If not, you would have to go through and continue. The worst thing here is when you restore to a point in time, and that was the point in time when the sales table was dropped, Ooh, you're out of luck. You have to restore from the full backup again, restore the log backups in sequence, and repeat the process. But lucky enough that we have both the, the point in time when we created a snapshot and the one that we just restored. And we can do, uh, we can use this as well as a point of reference on which uh, we can do some comparisons. So this is the this is the uh, uh, table where excuse me the, the database where we've restored as part of our investigation. And we can do a quick comparison between those. Now a couple of things that you can do here, well again lucky enough, not lucky but because this is a, a scripted example. But in this case, if you found out that there were records in the point in time that you've restored an extra copy of the database and the snapshot, then you start retrieving those records using an option called insert select. That's one option where you can insert from the exact same copy of the database where you've inch through the transaction log as you're restoring the log backups and found a point in time when a couple of milliseconds before the drop table statement occurred and do an insert select or you can do or use the table diff dot exe executable the table diff executable is a utility that you use for replication you might be surprised but the idea here is you want to restore the records that were in the database that you were trying to investigate back into the production database that's already available that's one way to do it and then you will be able to recover as much record or as much records as many records as you can to the production database without causing a lot of downtime. You should, your database is technically online at this point. My uh, transactions are, are going on. My applications can connect to the database. Everyone's happy. And you can now reinsert those records back into the production database as part of your recovery sequence. Another option is to use the undocumented table valued function, fndblog. You can drop, if you want, you can simulate that. Let's do the exact same thing. Drop the database at this point. And if you're really not that sure, you can, again, use the FN, FNDB log undocumented table, by, table valued function. And you can review the contents of the transaction log without really guessing because everything that you do in the database is recorded inside the transaction log. Again, going back to the lesson on understanding the transaction log. Here, well, you know that the culprit is the administrator, and that's me. You got the description, and lo and behold, I've got, you scroll down a bit, my begin time. So you can use this in your stop at command. And this is a very good uh, approach and a very good way to 
use the stop at command value because you know exactly that this was the time when this particular incident happened. So you can possibly do a 20, uh, 21 and you know that you'll be accurate enough because it's inside a transaction log. So that's a very good way of using the function, uh, the undocumented table valued function fn db log. Not something that I would recommend because if you if you look at it, 11 seconds to read through the entire transaction log. I would recommend that you restore your transaction log backups or copy your transaction log backups to a remote SQL Server instance and you run the undocumented table valued function fn dump db log, which is almost exactly the same as the fndb log, except that instead of reading the transaction log, you're reading the transaction log backups. So again, go and take a look at this article on msqltips.com so you can walk through the example and have a look at practicing this particular recovery sequence and restore sequence to restore your database to a specific point in time. In the next demo, I'm going to show you how you can isolate critical objects both for high availability and disaster recovery. Ideally, it's recommended to move user-defined objects, your tables, store procedures, functions, views, and whatever else that you can think of off of the primary file group and into a user-defined file group. The reason behind that is simple. As long as your primary file group is offline, your database is technically offline. So imagine a 500 gigabyte data file inside a primary file group. It would take longer to recover the database, bring the database online with that size as compared to a data file that's roughly 15 or 16 megabytes. The goal is to bring the database online as quickly as we possibly can. So again, the recommendation is just to keep all the system objects in the primary file group, create user-defined file groups, and move the database objects or user-defined database objects into that user-defined file group so that you, you can bring the primary file group online and technically bring the database online while working through recovering the other portions of your user-defined file groups. So I'm going to be showing you that in a demo. In this demo, I'm going to walk you through the process of isolating highly critical objects into their own user-defined file groups or even doing the reverse, keeping your highly critical objects inside your primary file group for high availability and disaster recovery strategies. This is typically known as online piecemeal restore. SQL Server 2005 Enterprise Edition introduced that feature where you can slowly, piece by piece, bring the database online and maybe categorize some of the file groups that you need to bring online as those that are most more, more highly critical than others. As a point of reference, I'd like to point you to an article that I wrote a couple of years ago on MS SQL Tips, isolating critical objects for SQL Server disaster recovery procedures. And in this article, I used Microsoft's Northwind database, so you can try it out yourself. I've made some changes on the Northwind database by creating a new user-defined file group and moved some of the user uh, tables inside that user-defined file groups. So try this thing out, go and take a look at the article, copy the scripts, understand how the process works so you can walk through it yourself. But this will be the basis of the demo that I'm going to do today. Just like anything else, all of the user databases that we typically work with start with the usual single file, single file group configuration. So in this case, what I'll do is I'll create a user defined file group and I'll add a file into that file group. Again, you can also do the reverse as I mentioned earlier, because the goal is, is to bring your database online as quickly as, po as you possibly can, thereby meeting your recovery time objective. If the database or if the primary file group is offline, technically the database is offline. So you can 
look at it in a reverse way where you can keep all your highly critical objects in the primary file group. The sooner you can bring the primary file group online, the quicker your database looks or appears to be online. So I've got my user defined file group and we can always validate that the file group has been created. So there we go. We've created one extra data file inside our new user defined file group at, and it's on the G drive. Now my G drive is not a logical partition in my, my operating system. It's a physical partition in my operating system. It's not that large of a drive, about four gigabyte. I just want to demonstrate how this thing works. If it was a logical partition, well, bad luck if that physical partition or the LUN that contains that logical partition suddenly crashes. In this case, I'm isolating that specific file group to its own disk partition, physical disk, not logical disk. Once I have that file group, I can decide to move my critical objects into that file group. So what I'm doing here is I am recreating my clustered index. And since your base table is your clustered index or your clustered index is your base table, by recreating this index on my new user defined file group, I'm basically telling SQL Server you move my entire table into that new file group. And since I'm on the enterprise edition, this is an online index operation. And to prove that, I can fire off a bunch of transactions. They're all running, reading off some of the records from the sales table and at the same time, uh, inserting rows as well. So all my transactions are going while the index operation is running, again, an online operation. And you can take a look at the disk usage report to look at how your data is spread out across multiple file groups. In this case, you can look at the disk space used by data files report. So I currently have, so this is my new user defined file group in my G drive currently about 170 megabytes. My, my assumption is the 119, 192 megabytes of data will be moved into the new user defined file groups. So my index operation is done. Click refresh. And uh, take a look at the disk space used by data files report. I now have my entire sales table into my user defined file group. I know I still have like one or two or three tables inside my primary file group. Again, depending on your strategy, you can move your critical objects in a new user defined file group or keep them inside the primary file group and leave the non critical objects in the new user defined file group. I also want to highlight a couple of reports that are available out of the box from Wooden Management Studio. I'm using the disk usage report, but there are a bunch of other reports that you can use for your daily uh, maintenance and administration tasks like backup and restore events, all transactions, and so on and so on. Once that's done, first thing that I need to do every time I make changes to the database is to perform a full database backup. I just want to make sure that I have a point of reference for anything that may happen. Of course, we know that something's going to happen because we're going to introduce some corruptions and issues in this particular database. Once my backup is done, I will simulate a disk corruption on drive G. Well, not that easy to do on very large systems, but since this is my own test environment, I'll just simulate this corruption and I want you to pay attention to drive letter G under disk management. If you noticed drive G just went haywire, it just disappeared out of disk management. Let's take a look at the Windows Explorer. Drive G is also gone. So from the point of view of the operating system, the drive is gone. Technically, SQL Server will also see that the drive or the data file is gone. 
but let's see what happens. If you run a checkpoint process, which of course runs on a regular basis, but let's imagine that SQL Server hasn't yet executed the checkpoint process. When we do, we see this error and it says failed to generate a checkpoint. Going back to our lesson on understanding transaction log, all your changes are being stored in the transaction log. And during checkpoint processes, they get flushed to the data file. In this case, my transactions are still running. If you noticed, I'm still inserting records into the sales table, even though the data file and the drive that contains the data file is gone because all these changes are, are being pushed into the transaction log. You have to be very careful with this because you'll, all, you'll end up having a bloated transaction log file because the transaction log can get flushed because of this. And indeed, it points to a corrupted data file. In this case, it's actually a corrupted drive. So what do we do? Well, we do have our full database backup. I just, I'm just showing you some of the error messages from, uh, from SQL Server. We need to take the database file offline. That's the first thing that we need to do. We need to take the database file offline. And after taking the file offline, of course, you're still going to get this, right? Because your drive G is missing. So after taking the file offline, we just want to verify that the file is indeed offline. Then we can start recovering that file. So the strategy here is to move the data file to an extra drive because your drive G is gone. So what we're going to do here is we're going to move this particular data file and the file group into drive F instead of drive G. And of course, by taking that particular drive offline or that particular file offline, my transactions are gone. And I can reissue the transactions, but since every, every single one of those transactions are hitting that specific table, no transactions will be able to perform their tasks until that table is brought online. So what do we do? First thing that we need to do again, as always, back up the tail of the log. Once the tail of the log has been backed up, we can use our full database backup working, full database backup, I just want to point that out, and move the damage file from G to F. Restore that particular data file from G to F. And after restoring that particular data or that data file, at this point, since we're only restoring that specific data file, in essence, the entire sales table, I can still perform some transactions on the database as long as it's not affecting that damaged file. If you look closely, I can still query my products table inside my demo sales DB database. This again is partial database availability at its best. You can still query the products table. Again, any other transactions that do not touch the damaged file and all the objects in the damaged file, your database is technically online. Well, partially online in this case. Restore the tail of the log backup. And make sure that the database is online. Well, notice that my drive is now drive letter F because my drive G has been corrupted. Data file is online. I can simulate or reissue back my transactions and everything is back to normal. Again, highlighting the fact that even though that file is damaged and you're trying to recover the file, all the other objects in the database that are not in that damaged file are still accessible. In the next demo, I'm gonna show you how to use table partitioning for both high availability and disaster recovery for your highly critical tables. In SQL Server 2005, table partitioning was introduced as a means to 
design very large tables so you can store them in partitions which in turn can be stored in different physical disk subsystems. This improves query performance especially if a query has to go across all of the records inside a table with multiple disk subsystems working together to return a query, queries returns, uh, return results faster. Table partitioning is also a great way to implement data archiving. So data that's less accessed can be stored in less cheaper disk subsystems. You can even put the data in read-only file if you want to because they're not really changed that often. Compare that with volatile data, data that's frequently accessed and frequently changing. That can be stored in highly redundant disk arrays and you can provide redundancy and protection and even higher performance for that specific subset of data. That's what I'm going to do in the next demo. Switching gears here to my demo environment, I'm going to show you how you can partition your tables for higher availability. Similar to the previous demo, in case you want to follow along and do this as part of your disaster recovery exercise, take a look at this article that I wrote on msequaltips.com on how to partition tables with multiple file groups for high availability. Again, don't get ticked off by the fact that I specifically mentioned SQL Server 2005 because again, I did this back when I still was working with SQL 2005 and it still works with SQL Server 2012. I still use the Northwind database for this example. Some of the things that I did here was create new file groups, added a new file to those file groups, create partition scheme, partition function. And again, I totally recommend that you walk through this article copy the scripts, follow the procedures, and practice this on your own. Going back, I'm still gonna use my demo sales DB sample database for this particular demo. To start off, I wanna show you my uh, database is no different from the previous demos that I've done where the usual single for data file, single file group setup, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a file group similar to my previous demo. The only difference here is instead of just adding one data file and one extra file group, I'm going to add four. So sales data partition two, three, and four. What I did as well is to partition or create those data files and file groups across my drives E, F, and G. In, in my previous demo, uh, you've seen how these are actually physical disk partitions in my Windows operating system. So now I'm creating my data file and my file group inside those data files. I'm also going to be referencing back again to my disk usage report uh, that's built into Management Studio just to show you how my a table is partitioned and how the number of records are spread out across those different data files and those file groups. So to start with, all my data is in my primary file group, 192 megabytes of, all, uh, of them, 64 KB allocated for all of the data files that I've used in my file group. Again, similar to what I did in the previous demo, is I'm going to kick off a workload that again adds record or records into my sales table. Now, once my my uh, files and file groups are are uh, provisioned and created. I can now start using those files and file groups. But before I can use them, first I'll create a partition function. In this case, I will be using the range write option for my partition function. 
what I did was to create four partitions. The first partition would be for values between zero and two million. Second would be between two million and four million. The third will be between four million and six million. And the fourth one will be for anything above six million. So I'm gonna create that partition function. Next, I'll be creating the partition scheme. And the partition scheme that I will be using here will take advantage of the partition function so that my records will be subdivided across all four file groups based on my partition function. So I'm gonna create that and I'll do an online operation, again, similar to the demo that I've previously done, so that I can literally take the sales table from my primary file group and spread them across different file groups, in this case, using the partition scheme and the partition function. Again, similar to my previous demo, I'm gonna use an online index operation by creating a unique clustered index, but instead of using a file group, I'll be using my partition scheme, passing my primary key value, or primary key column, to recreate that clustered index. So I'm gonna kick that off. This takes quite a while to uh, to run, and again, referencing back to my disk usage report as I've been doing, just so you'll see the, uh, the way that the data has been uh, spread out across different file groups, and you'll see that newer data that will, will come into the sales table will be allocated to the latest or the fourth partition. So notice that I have about 46.63 megabytes for my first, second, and third partitions, roughly. My fourth partition is still getting populated. But once this is done, you'll see the, roughly how the data is spread out across different partitions. Right, since the workload or the uh, index operation is done, Let's do one more refresh of the disk usage report for my demo sales DB database and see how the data is spread out across those different partitions. So they're roughly almost spread out evenly except for the last partition. And you see again, as I've mentioned in previous demo, online operation, one of the key features of Enterprise Edition, I still have all my transactions running while doing an index operation. Similar to what we've done in the previous demo, anytime you make any major change in your database, make sure you take a full database backup. But before I do that, I wanna make sure that my database is in full recovery model. All right, so my database is in full recovery model. I just wanna make sure that my database is in full recovery model because that's the only way I can do point in time recoverability. So I'm done. Back up my sample database. Then I'm gonna look at how my data is spread out across the different partitions. First, I'll take a look at the partition metadata. In this case, I see my index ID, my index ID for clustered indexes are have a value of one. They're all spread out across the different partitions. You got four partitions here. Of course, your object ID will be the object ID of the table that I partitioned. Let's take a look at the different uh, data as they are spread out across different partitions. So as uh, I mentioned, part of the definition of our partition function is to have a range, right? Anything in between 2,000 and 4,000 is on second. Anything less than 2,000 is on the first. 
and so on and so forth. Well, technically, anything that's higher than six, uh, 6 million will be on the fourth partition. I don't really have to provide this, but just to take a look at the results, again, partition number one, anything below 2 million. Partition number two, anything above 2 million. Partition number three, anything above 4 million, less than 6 million. And partition number four is anything greater than 6 million. All right. Next, of course, we know that, well, the records are available. We don't really have to do this, but let's see. Same thing. So here's what I'm going to do, right? I will simulate a disk corruption, similar to the one that I did in the previous demo. I'm going to switch back to my disk management console so that you can see how my G drive, and again, I keep mentioning that this is a physical disk partition, not a logical disk partition, and you would see the G drive disappear so that the operating system can no longer see it. Quick refresh of disk management, or maybe I should do an alt tab so that you can see from there. Sometimes it takes quite a while for, for that to disappear. Do a quick refresh. And once the disk partition is gone from the operating system, and you, you've probably seen a disk tree became unknown, it's unallocated, our usual four gigabyte disk G is now gone. Of course, from the operating system perspective, if we look at Windows Explorer, drive G is also gone, right? Now, even though the disk partition has been corrupted, we can still query the records. And what we're more concerned about is partition number four because the G drive contains the fourth partition. We run a query and yes, we get all results. Same as before. The reason for this is again, going back to the lesson on understanding transaction log is that these are all in cache. SQL Server no longer has to go to the drive to retrieve the records and display the records because they are in the buffer cache. Let's try and run an update statement on a record that is on the corrupted drive. Remember, drive G contains the fourth partition and the fourth partition contains records that have sales ID values greater than 6 million. So let's run an update statement and whoa, that seems to be interesting because my update statement worked, even though the disk containing that record is gone. How is that possible? And again, going back to our lesson on understanding transaction log, the records are being modified in cache and then stored in the transaction log. Regular checkpoints will flush the records from the transaction log into the disk. Now, I don't really have to run a checkpoint in this case, but let's pretend that SQL Server hasn't run a checkpoint and let's run a manual checkpoint and see what happens. Whoa, there's the error message that we were expecting. We know that it's not an insufficient memory. We do know that it has something to do with the drive. And you can expand the error message if you want to uh, read more about what SQL Server returned. But basically, we were still able to update the record on that particular partition. But when we try to run, or even if you don't try to run, because SQL Server will regularly run checkpoint process, it cannot persist the change into the data file on disk because technically the disk is not there. So the change is still marked in the transaction log but cannot be persisted on disk. 
So let's verify that the record has been committed. If you look closely, this was the row that we've updated. Again, this is being read from the buffer cache. Let's try and running a drop clean buffers. Not something that I would recommend that you do in your production environment, but just to prove that everything that's been happening is possible because SQL Server is processing the query and checking the buffer cache and returning that uh, the results to you. In this case, we can again rerun the same query that we ran earlier and now we can get an error in this case because well we've flushed the buffer cache the update statement and the record that was updated is no longer in cache well the good thing is it's in the transaction log so what do we do at this point well what we do is we switch the database to offline in this case not the whole database if you notice my transactions are still working right transactions that are supposed to be saved into the sales data uh, sales table particularly on the fourth partition is still going on again the reason being transaction log everything's being written to the transaction log not getting persisted to the data file yet because the data file is not available so we'll start recovering the database. So the first thing that we do in this case, similar to what we did in the previous demo, is switch that specific partition offline. That's the only way that we can work on recovering that specific partition is to take it offline and notice that all my transactions are gone. But you can always retry your transactions. And of course, at this point, anything that's hitting that specific uh, file group stored in that corrupted drive is no longer uh, available. So all, your, uh, all the queries and all the transactions are going to fail. In this case, the good thing about this is this specific transaction is not hitting my, my corrupted drive. Therefore, it's still running. So this is, again, one of the cool features for Enterprise Edition is you, got, you get partial database availability. So what do we need to do next? Well, now that we have the partition set offline, of course, we, we can verify that. Partition set offline, particularly partition number four, set offline. Now, now that we have that, we can start just like what we did before, taking a tail of the log backup. Of course, if we if we verify, all of the queries would work except for the query that will hit the corrupted file. In this case, again, partition number four. So let's take tail of the log backup, which we will use as part of our restore sequence. We'll take the tail of the log backup. And again, keeping in mind that our database is still partially available. Taking the tail of the log backup will restore the database to restore that corrupted partition using our working full database backup. But instead of storing it on the G drive, we're going to store it on the F drive. So we'll take the full database backup, move the file in partition four to the drive letter F. Once that's done, we can now use the tail of the log backup to bring, and again, we restore the database. But if you look closely, we just restored that specific file. And that file is the only one that's currently offline. And that is why my transactions or my applications are still working. Because only that file was taken offline. And as long as my other applications are not hitting that specific file or that file group, I'm good. So 
So once we restore that file, we can now take the tail of the log backup and restore the tail of the log backup. The tail of the log backup will look at the log sequence number and knows which specific files or file groups will be affected when restoring and only apply the changes to those specific affected files or file groups. Once that's done, we can, well, let's check if we are really done. Let's run a query and whoa, I'm still seeing this particular error. What does this mean? Well, my guess is that the database and all of the different files and file groups are still not in a consistent state. Let's take a look one more time and see if that assumption is indeed correct. The way to verify that is to check the status of the database file or file group that we restored. In this case, drive F is now where my partition 4 is stored. Well, but databases or the database file is still in restoring phase. This means that the point in time that this particular database file is restored is still not the same as the entire database. We need to bring the database file to a point in time that's exactly the same as all the other files in the database. So what do we do? Well, just like what we did earlier, we take another tail of the log backup. So in this case, I'm going to take a tail of the log backup. I'll just uh, grab this, run a query. And I will use this second tail of the log backup to bring the database, that specific file group to be specific to its point in time, similar to the rest of the database files and file groups. Switch to my master database. And of course, I need to switch that as well to my master database. I'll back up the tail of the log and restore the tail of the log. Once that's done, again, we can always rerun the same query that we had earlier and verify that all of the, uh, all the records are now available. We'll query partition one, partition two, partition three, and now the partition that we just restored from drive G to drive F. Notice that the query ran successfully and one thing that I really want to highlight is the fact that because we've restored the database to that specific point in time, the changes that were affected by that update statement has now been persisted to the data file that we restored from drive G to drive F. Take a look at, again, the article on msequiptips.com on how you can take a look at table partitioning as a strategy to provide higher availability and, of course, for your disaster recovery uh, strategies for very large tables. The last demo in this compilation is how to perform page level restores. SQL Server 2005 introduced the feature to allow database administrators to restore pages instead of entire database. I mean, think about it. If you're dealing with very large databases, terabyte, terabyte size databases, and only a handful of pages got corrupted, you wouldn't want to be restoring the entire database because when you're doing so, your database is technically offline. If your goal is higher availability, you want to keep your database as available as much as you possibly can, even though you're performing piecemeal restores like I've done in the previous demos, or in this case, several pages getting corrupted. So let's take a look at the demo and I'll walk you through the process. Switching gears back to my demo environment, I am going to walk you through the process of performing page level restores. 
want a quick reference to the MS SQL Tips article that I wrote a couple of years ago on using Page Lover Restore as a disaster recovery procedure. I know you're seeing SQL Server 2005, but again, the, the steps, the process will work with SQL Server 2005 up to SQL Server 2012. The assumption here is, of course, you have a good working backup, not a backup that also contained the corrupt pages. So it's one of those reasons where you really need to test your backups and making sure that they're really, really working well. Now I've used a, a copy of the Northwind database for this article, but it would a bit of a twist. I intentionally corrupted some of the pages in the Northwind database, not something that I recommend, especially in production environment or anything that you think is important. But I would strongly recommend that you play, play around with how to corrupt a database using the steps outlined by SQL Server MVP Kendra Little here. Uh, he, she actually walked through, through the process of how to corrupt a database. Again, not something that I recommend, but for practice, try corrupting a database and restoring from backups, just like what I'm doing here today. It's a bit of tricky, uh, tricky though, because you, you you will be using a hex, a hex editor. Again, I'm doing this in a demo environment, a lab environment, and it's safe for me to do. Now, the database that I'm using here is already corrupted. In fact, let me show you that indeed it is corrupted. So I'm gonna uh, query the sales table inside my MetroDB database, anything above 1460 sales ID. And if you look at the results of the query, I've got about 10 records, returned 10 records, and after the 10th record, I get an error like this, incorrect checksum, and it also tells me the page number that is corrupted. So what SQL Server did was, it scanned through the pages containing the records in the sales table, and when it hit that specific page that's corrupted, threw off an, threw off an error, but then it already returned some of the records that were not in the corrupted page. So if you see some errors that pertain to logical consistency, in this case, uh, an incorrect checksum, don't get discouraged, don't get stricken off by the fact that you're seeing such errors. But what I strongly recommend is run DBCC check DB. This will tell you more about the corruption that occurred so in this case, I'm seeing page 157, which was consistent with the uh, previous error that we got. I'm seeing page 147 and page 156 in uh, the error message. Um, my approach has always been to try and fix one page at a time, depending on how critical the, the corruption is. Of course, again, as I mentioned, practice this. Don't get caught up on the fact that you might be doing this the first time when a disaster strikes. And that's one reason I'm showing you this. So here I've seen a couple of uh, page uh, page numbers that are being reported as corrupted. 157, it says, uh, was not seen in the scan, but page 147, 156 referred to it. Pages 147 and 156 are telling me that they're referring to 157, but the page is corrupt. I can take a look at 160, but since 157 comes before 160, I'll try to look at 157 first, try to repair that first, and see if that would be more than enough. So you can have a lot of options. Let's take a look at the page in detail. I usually use the DBCC page. This is an undocumented uh, DBCC command. DBCC trace on with trace flag 3604 just displays the re uh, result of DBCC page on my management studio results pane. So if you look at the page, you know, nothing fancy. It's the usual dump of the entire page. But really, there is something in here that SQL Server sees as some inconsistencies. And that's why it's reporting that page corruption error. So what do we do? The first thing that we do, of course, just like anything else, 
is to back up the tail of the log. So let's perform a tail of the log backup. Next, we grab a full working backup that contains the corrupted pages. Notice there's really nothing in here that's fancy aside from the page clause with the uh, specific page number. So that's the file ID and the page ID. So I'm looking at the full database backup, grabbing page 157 for file number one. Notice I didn't have a with no recovery option here, which means while I'm doing this restore, I can still query my, my the tables inside my MetroDB database. No need for no recovery because what will happen is that SQL Server will flag that page only, not the entire database, but just that page and mark it a, uh, as a page that's restoring so that we can continue to apply transaction log backups, maybe sequence of transaction log backups after the latest full backup. So I'm going to restore that and to prove that to you, I can do a select star from MetroDB dot dbo dot you know a couple of uh well not the pay the, the sales table or yeah maybe we could do the sales where the sales id is maybe less than 100. i can i can query the database i can query even that table that contains the corrupt page except for that page that is being marked as currently in a restoring phase. Now, once that's done, I can restore my tail of the log backup. And notice my tail of the log backup does not contain a no recovery because what it will do is again, it will just apply the transactions that are that pertain to that specific page that I just restored and it will know how to roll forward those changes. Let's verify if my MetroDB database has been fixed. Well, good enough. My, uh, my page level restore worked. Let's query our sales table again. Notice that earlier, anything, uh, uh, a sales ID with a value higher than 1460 is throwing me corruption errors. If I remove the where clause and just acquire the entire table, I don't get any error message because now that my page has been restored. This is just one case, one instance where a single page has been corrupted and we can restore that page using page level restore again, available in the enterprise edition. And since I can do my Taylor log backup, the assumption here is of course, my database is in full recovery model. It's one of those features that you can take advantage of in Enterprise Edition where you can you know, just fix one page as long as no other application is querying that page, everything appears to be online. Again, there are multiple variations, multiple scenarios where you can fix a database corruption. Page Double Restore is just one of them to provide higher availability for your database.